pretty faithful representation of Nirvana at that exact point in time. I mean, that is really what their music sounded like. Most of the new songs they had written with Chad Channing on the drums had a slightly had a different feel than the songs they were doing with that they had been doing with Dale. The songs they had been doing with Dale were a little more Melvinsy, a little heavier, and the stuff they were working up with Chad was still sort of that '70s kind of riff rock, but it was becoming a little more. The, the vocal melodies were becoming a little more thought out, um, and that was the one thing that struck me about them was his particular ear for melody. He would have these strange guitar riffs, but then he would have a vocal melody that was completely different, for instance, about a girl, which was sort of the odd tune on Bleach. Uh, because most of Bleach is what I would call riff rock. You know, it's like Deep Purple or Budgie or something like that. It's basically heavy riffing and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of classic, classic riff rock. Almost heavy metal, but not quite. Uh, and uh, About a Girl was kind of the odd song because it's sort of the melodic uh, pop tune, if you will. And uh, it sort of stuck out. And Kurt said, you know, I don't know if people will be ready for this song, but I really want to do one pop song on this record. So, and I, I, mean, I said, hey, you know, I'm just the engineer here, you know, whatever, I'll make it sound good. You go ahead. <laughs> Pop arranged a US tour to promote the album, and with Bleach quickly becoming an underground hit, Nirvana finally started to play sellout dates. The second time we went on the road in, in the States, and Bleach was out, I mean, we noticed a significant difference in the people that showed up at the venues and stuff. I mean, just everywhere we were playing, you know, was being packed. And we were thinking, wow. This is uh, this is really cool, and of course there was a big difference too in the in the in the money we were making. I mean, the first time we went out, we'd be we'd be you know praying to make at least 50 bucks so we can put gas in the tank and you know maybe a sandwich or two from a 7-Eleven to get us to the next venue. But uh, second time around during during the bleach, you know, I mean, we realized things were changing. You know, we we had much better guarantees. We weren't worrying about gas or you know having to buy sandwiches at the 7-Eleven. You know, none of that was a problem. And, um, and we also had, uh, you know, we were doing radio uh, interviews uh, from time to time. We played, uh, we played this uh, show called Lane Fest at, at the Moore Theater in, uh, in Seattle, um, down 2nd Virginia. And we packed the place. And it was, it was uh, I can't remember the bill, there was a lot of it was Mud Honey and um, us, uh, Tad. Um, Ah, I can't. I can't remember the rest of the bands, but uh, it was the first time I actually played, you know, the Moore Theater, a, a big place that seated more than just, you know, it could max capacity of 250 people. You know, it was it was big. In late 1989, Nirvana began their first European tour, an attempt to capitalize on the success of Bleach in the UK. The tour followed a frenetic schedule of 37 shows in 42 days, and Kurt's behavior became increasingly erratic as the strain of growing success began to show. Kurt would often sink into depressed moods during the tour and started to talk about moving back into his mother's house in Aberdeen. At least in my mind, when growing up, I always pictured, wow, you know, that's, you know, that's when bands really get big, like when, the, you know, when you know, Europe asks you to come over and play for them, it was like, wow, that's a cool thing. And, uh, but we, uh, we really enjoyed, our, enjoyed that whole deal. And, and um, I think uh, with, with those shows, we knew that uh, you know, things were really, you know, really starting to happen for, uh, for Nirvana. He actually seemed very happy with how things went from, you know, from the time they recorded their first demo and sent it to record labels and getting a record deal and um, you know making an making the record and going on tour a bunch of times and making an EP through that whole process he never really griped or groused or or seemed to feel that he wanted to, you know wanted to go further or that it wasn't what he had expected so I mean he already seemed happy when he wasn't a rock star he just seemed happy to have a music career 
1991, with Chad Channing replaced by drummer Dave Grohl, Nirvana released their second studio album, Nevermind. Nevermind launched Nirvana as a global phenomenon and pushed Kurt into the responsibilities of adulthood and fame. Over the years that followed, the transition from shy, small-town artist to international rock icon proved ultimately to be a leap that Kurt could not make. I don't know how much he ever enjoyed things. Um, he found uh, fun, but enjoyment, that's a difficult question to put to the issue of Kurt Cobain. Because Kurt had never indicated any desire to be a star, and so he, I'd never even thought about, like, does he have the talent to be a big star? Because it takes more than just the talent. It takes the desire, and you have to make a series of decisions that put you in the position to become a big star. And I actually never expected him to make those, that's, those decisions. He never, it was kind of a surprise um, when they made a pretty commercial record. I think he enjoyed his success in the fact that he felt validated that Finally, he proved himself that he wasn't a loser from Aberdeen, you know, high school dropout, that he was, he was successful at what he did. And, but I think um, it was hard for him to be as famous as he was, where he couldn't go anywhere without being recognized and having just the you know, minutest detail written about him, anything that happened. He once mentioned one time that, uh, you know, the best, some of the best times that uh, Kurt ever had were back in the old days when uh, we were just, you know, traveling around in our van and, you know, hoping to scrape up enough to get to the next show. And, uh, and, and that things uh, for Kurt just got uh, tougher and tougher. And I think the, you know, I think just the overall stress and demand that's put on you once, you know, you're picked up by a major label and, and, and all of a sudden you find out that so much of your life you've got so little control of. Um, you know, because it's all, you know, it's kind of a big money machine and all of a sudden you're, you've turned into a chess piece. And, uh, and I don't, I, c I can't ever imagine Kurt being happy, you know, as a pawn in anything or anybody's game. And I truly don't think he was. And I don't think he really enjoyed the, I don't think he was the kind of person uh, to enjoy the kind of success that he had. I don't think he wasn't, you know, built or made for that. Um, you know, personally, I think he should have just called it quits and moved down to Mexico and lived the rest of his life in solitude or whatever, you know. But uh, as we all know, you know, nothing like that transpired. This note should be pretty easy to understand. All the warnings from the punk rock 101 curses over the years since my first introduction to the, shall we say, ethics involved with independence and the embracement of your community has proven to be very true. I haven't felt the excitement of listening to as well as creating music, along with really writing something for too many years now. I feel guilty beyond words about these things. For example, when we're backstage and the lights go out and the manic roar of the crowd begins, it doesn't affect me the way in which it did for Freddie Mercury, <laughs> who seemed to love and relish the love and adoration from the crowd. Well, Kurt, so fucking what? Then don't be a rock star, you asshole. Which is something I totally admire and envy. The fact is, I can't fool you, any one of you. It simply isn't fair to you or to me. The worst crime I can think of would be to pull people off by faking it, pretending as if I'm having 100% fun. No, Kurt, the worst crime I can think of is for you to just continue being a rock star when you fucking hate it and just fucking stop. <laughs>